so by show of hands, who was here for the morning service? Okay, so everybody, while the hands are in the air, look to your left, look to your right, see there are hands up. So for those of you who were here, you know that Pastor Ed Stetzer preached a wonderful sermon on peace in the midst of difficult circumstances. So when I saw that and when I heard that great sermon this morning and I knew what I was going to preach on tonight, it got me thinking and now I just have one question. Who in here is having such difficult circumstances that they overprayed and got two sermons on the same topic? Because it was somebody with their hand up, I'm fairly confident. Or not. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here with you all to continue worshiping this great God who has given us the opportunity to have peace with him. Uh, as everybody has said, we are continuing, coming to the end of our series uh, called Stressed Out. And we've heard some great messages from Pastors Best and uh, Targe uh, and Baker about some of the very nitty gritty specifics about things that cause us to be stressed out, things that cause us to have problems. And tonight, as we look at peace and we see what God has for us, I want to put kind of one caveat out there. Because in Christendom, there is a tendency to sometimes think that, you know, if only I prayed a little harder, or if I read my Bible a little more, it's, it's my failings. I'm not a good enough Christian. That's why God has not taken this suffering from me. And I want to just gently say that, well, A, that may be true for some of you. That may be true for some of us. I know that I don't read my Bible. I don't pray like I ought to. I don't live like God would ultimately have me to live. But for many of you, you need to know that God is there in your suffering, and he does not promise an end to those circumstances. In some cases, faithful men and women throughout history have struggled their entire lives and never seen an end to that sense within them. Uh, so just take that with you as we look at this. The Scottish reformer John Knox was once asked how he could so recklessly defy the wicked Mary, Queen of Scots. And Knox answered saying, when you have spent time on your knees before the King of Kings, you do not find the Queen of Scotland to be quite so frightening. Uh, little background, my kids have been watching a lot of How to Train Your Dragon and Shrek, so it took a lot of restraint for me to not use a bad Scottish accent when I read that. Uh, you're welcome. So Knox had peace preaching against a hostile government that definitely had the power and the will to do him harm. So before we go much further, what is peace? Right? Our world often defines peace as some version of an absence of conflict. Biblically, both in the Old Testament and the New, it implies wholeness, prosperity, fulfillment, security associated with God's dwelling amongst his people, a sense of true harmony with each other, ourselves, and God, real rest. Peace is a concept talked about all over the Bible, Old Testament and New. And really the challenge to somebody wanting to preach on this topic is what passage do you pick? Like it's everywhere, it is everywhere. But my first thought went to the book of Philippians. I know we have looked at it briefly in this series and yeah, we're gonna come back because I'm, I'm, I'm the one preaching. Uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians is among my favorite New Testament writings. It's often described as his most joy-filled letter. And for those of you who don't know, it's written while Paul is sitting in a Roman jail. He is in chains for the gospel and it's written to the believers in a town called Philippi for their support, uh, to thank them for their support and to encourage them. So turn with me if you would in your Bibles or Bible apps to Philippians 4. Uh, for those of you who are new to reading a Bible, Philippians is towards the back of the book. Uh, the big numbers that you see on the page are the chapters, the little numbers of the verses. Those are not original, those were added much later so that we could turn to something really quickly and find it when we needed it. But for now, let's just read along in the screen or in the bulletin. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 
Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. All right, so you know where we're headed. I want to take a look at this text and I want to see that Paul is giving us three traits of a peaceful person. And, and then by, by application, I want to ask some questions about what those traits are, what that means, and kind of see how he, he presents this to us. So these are traits that are not necessarily obvious to those of us who are in a stressed out state. And for many of us, these are traits that are going to be somewhat counterintuitive. Verses 8 and 9 are going to provide some insight into how he maintained in that piece. And this is not just blowing smoke on Paul's part. This is not somebody writing about something they don't know anything about and they're just, "Ah, I, I think this would probably be a thing to bring you peace. This is a man intimately familiar with pain, with suffering, with very, very challenging circumstances. And yet his writings are saturated with praise for the God who he knew to be behind everything that happened to him. And so these traits are coming from Paul's own experience and I believe describe his own life. So right back to verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Straight out of the gates, this is fairly offensive to some of you. Uh, Like, dude, you don't know my life. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what's been done to me. How can you tell me to rejoice right now? And, and I have the privilege of being able to say, hey, man, it ain't me. It was Paul. So, like, don't, it's, I'm not saying it, it. This is Paul. I'm just telling you what Paul said, okay? Verse 5, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Reasonableness. What the heck am I supposed to do with that? Well, the Greek word that gets translated here as reasonableness has a range of possible meanings, right? And I think this is kind of helpful because this is a bigger concept than just being reasonable. It's it's not insisting on every right or letter of law or custom. It's yielding, it's gentle, kind, courteous, tolerant. Uh, This has implications for our sanctification and our maturity. Uh, And I think you can kind of boil this down in modern parlance to just be cool, don't panic, don't flip out when something bad happens, okay? It's a lot to crank in for the rest of this sermon. I'm just going to keep using reasonableness, but carry all of that semantic range with you, if you please. Uh, Verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So I'm stressed out, and your advice is don't be anxious. It's very helpful, Justin. Thanks for nothing. All right, hang in there, okay? Okay. This is a two-parter. It's don't be anxious, but be prayerful, all right? This is huge. This is, Paul is building to the how of these descriptors of the peaceful person. So if this doesn't make sense at the end, if at the end of this sermon you're like, okay, I, I didn't follow the logic, next sermon's free, it's my guarantee. All right, so restated, rejoice, take it easy, have reasonableness, Don't be anxious, but pray, and you get peace. All right, so now Paul is going to give us what I believe is the key to peace in every circumstance. It's in verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And I think we can distill this verse down to one word, perspective. Okay, this is the one word takeaway that I would like for you all to leave here with tonight. Nothing in Paul's life makes any sense at all unless you can see and understand the perspective by which he viewed those circumstances. So I want to ask a couple of questions here, kind of by practical application, about these things and about your life. Question number one What are you seeing? And can you rejoice? What are you seeing? The command to rejoice is not natural to somebody who is feeling very stressed out. It's not the thing that we just instinctively want to do when the walls are closing in and we are freaking out a little bit, okay? Our seeming inability to rejoice in our circumstances has everything to do, though, with how you view those circumstances, 
So I ask you again, what are you seeing when you look at your life? Do you see the mountain of work piling up on the desk and it just, it just keeps getting taller? Do you see the mountain of bills piling up because there is just not quite enough money at the end of the month? Do you see your angry uh, jerk of a boss or coworker is around every corner waiting to just mess with you and disrupt your day? Do you see a spouse who doesn't seem to understand your needs, what it is you're coming from, what, what happened to you today? They're just, they're not with you. You're not getting it. Do you see a diagnosis from your doctor that is going to change the trajectory of your life as you thought it should have been? So what are you seeing? Can you see the problems but not the God behind it all? I'm going to jump in the the Bible back to the Old Testament for a second. The book of 2 Kings. In the Old Testament, we've got, well, there's a 1 Kings, because there's a 2 Kings. Uh, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, and they give us sort of a condensed history of the Jewish people, starting with the reign of their first good, well, Saul wasn't really good, but their first great monarch with David, and then moving all the way as the, Israel, the Israelite people sort of just fall into decay and the kings get more and more corrupt, but it gives us a sense of what's happening. And in 2 Kings chapter 6, we are at a place where we're in a divided kingdom and there is a king of Syria who is at war with a king of Israel. And the, like kings do when they're at war, they are trying to murder one another and do great harm to each other. And the king of Syria is becoming increasingly frustrated because the king of Syria keeps sending armies in very clever ways around the back of the, the army of Israel. And, oh, he's going to come in from the east. He's going to come in from the west. And every time he tries to do something, well, the king of Israel finds out about it from his prophet Elisha who God is telling what's happening. So the king of Syria goes to his advisors and he's like, okay, which of you guys ratted me out because I'm about to separate his head from his body? And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. There is a prophet in Israel named Elisha and he is telling the king of Israel everything you're doing in your own bedroom. It ain't us. So that brings us up to 2 Kings 6, 15 to 17, where the king of Syria says, ah, oh, no problem, I've got this, I will just send an army to kill Elisha. So verse 15, 2 Kings 6, when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, alas, my master, what shall we do? And he said, do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then this next part, I visualize this is just me. Elisha is going to pray with like face palming it and sort of annoyed. Okay. Then Elisha prayed and said, oh Lord, please open the, his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. This is a, a visual that has stuck with me from my whole childhood. My dad had this scripture written on a three by five card stuck in the back of his closet. And so as young children do, and I'd be you know, running, playing hide and go seek, or I don't know, like just rooting through my dad's shoes for no reason, because that's what kids do, I would see it. And it always stuck with me. And then as I got older, I started really thinking about this imagery. You know, this is not just a picture of, oh, they're, they're orange colored dudes on horseback. This is the army of the almighty God who is described in terms of fire because they don't have a more appropriate word to describe what the terrifying glory of that looked like, okay? This is the same army that gets referenced later on in the Bible in 2 Thessalonians, in Revelation. This is scary and awesome, amazing things. And Elisha had the perspective to see, I'm not concerned about this because I've got that right behind me. And if we are to see God moving, we need to know God. And while I believe that God can and does use miraculous signs and wonders, pardon, even today, those are not the normal means by which he communicates his truth to us. All right? Theologians have two words that are very helpful here. These will be your only technical theology terms for the night, I promise. We have general revelation. All right? General revelation is 
so just saying God has revealed things about himself to us that we can all know from looking at the world around us. So we can know that God is big, that God is awesome. If you go to the Grand Canyon, you are going to come away with this sense of awe at what kind of God built this. Okay? And then there's special revelation. And this is God using the books of the Bible written by people he chose through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to reveal important things that we cannot get from looking at the Grand Canyon. So you look at the Grand Canyon, you see God is big, but you do not see the story of salvation, his plan of redemption. You get very little about Jesus Christ explicitly spelled out in looking at the Grand Canyon. So general revelation, special revelation. Okay, back to special revelation. The Bible is how we are to know God and how we are to see him better. And if you don't know the Bible well, if you're looking for a place to start, uh, I always recommend the Gospel of John is a wonderful kickoff point. A lot of people are starting with a 21-day challenge, uh, one chapter a day. It's 21 chapters. Uh, and I, I want to say this just because, look, don't misunderstand me. The entire Bible is beautiful beautiful and amazing, and it all is Christ-saturated and glorious. But if you have never read the Bible before, opening up and reading descriptive passages of how to build the temple or rules for the Levitical priesthood, those are not like first date maneuvers with the Bible. Okay, that is, that is it's a more challenging thing to leap into, all right? But it is, seriously, even the most obscure, obscure passage of the Bible is amazing. Don't let anybody tell you different. You don't need to unhitch from the Old Testament. It's glorious. Okay. So back to our question. What are you seeing? Do you have cause to rejoice? And sometimes your thing just moves on you. Do we only see the problems or can we see God moving behind it all? Can we see that in our trouble, God may be moving people to minister to us? Can we see the, that seemingly impossible circumstances may be happening because God knows we ain't that bright and we need seemingly impossible circumstances to get us to pay attention to him and see the things that really matter? Uh, Pastor Stetzer read this one this morning, James 1. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Do you see getting cancer as a random evil thing that's just part of a series of random evil things? Or can you see cancer, evil, awful cancer, as God's gift of suffering to bring you to himself and shape you for an eternity of unimaginable joy and glory? Now that second perspective does not mean that your life will be easy. Cancer is not easy. Death and dying are not easy. It will not be easy. But the second perspective means that in that cancer, you can know peace that will absolutely freak people out when they see you going through those circumstances. And it will make them have to ask, what is with you that this is how you respond to suffering? So this brings us to question two, where are you standing? Be reasonable, keep a level head. On its surface, this is a question very, very similar to the first one. Uh, Paul is giving instruction here on how we are to react to difficult circumstances and not make things worse. And when we think about it, I believe that we can only be expected to keep a level head, have rational reactions, and make rational decisions when our feet are securely planted somewhere safe. So Paul's command to be reasonable, I think more often than not, is a command to see that God is our firm foundation, to trust God so completely that we never mistake the bad thing that just happened for being more powerful than God. It's to give us a perspective that is rooted in the unchanging power and nature of God Almighty and his promises that he will never leave nor forsake us. Now, there are implications for maturity and holiness here that should, along with how we view our circumstances, help us to stand firm in faith and not lose sight of his ability to work in tough places. Look at verse 9 one more time. 
What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. His command to be reasonable, stay cool, react, and with calm maturity is extremely practical, but it's also intensely theological. So I don't know how you guys are when you're driving, when somebody cuts you off. Uh, But if someone cuts you off in traffic, whether it's intentional or not, and you just absolutely lose your mind, that says so much more about what's in your heart and what you're viewing that minor event as than it does about the other person. And since having kids, I've had to adjust my own responses a little bit to, uh, to other drivers. And I'm, I'm not saying I was ever in a, you know, not holier than that. I just, I was not a, a, a scream and swear at people, but I like to talk trash uh, at other drivers, you know, just like, no, oh, that was great. Nice driving, idiot, you know, and, and things that I don't want my children repeating. And, and sometimes you make it a little bit more elaborate, you know, it's like, oh, that's great. I, I like how you decided blinkers were optional. Look at the big man making his own rules. Oh, good for you. You know, like I've tried to back off of that, that sort of just eh, petty spirit. And I'm aiming to force myself to say, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I'm sure your blinker's broken, but God bless you, you know. Uh, it's taken a lot of effort, but it's for my kids. It's, it's doing well. But all right, traffic is a silly example. It's an easy, for, easy one for us to point to. What about our responses to other forms of bad news? What about the first rumors of a public figure in possible scandal? Are we super excited to jump on the bandwagon and say, you know, I knew that guy was no good. You could tell, I, you know, because he disagreed with me about this one other thing. And I just knew that guy did this bad thing and just jump on it. Or uh, what about political upheaval? We're in the season of that now, right? I, I wasn't going to go here, but all right, we're going here. I, do you spend all your energies telling everyone how upset and freaked out you are at what the president did or tweeted? Or maybe you're spending a ton of time telling everyone how freaked out you are about the Democrats possibly taking power? Does your social media presence broadcast partisan politics and angry tirades against your opponents, yet have a Bible verse and Jesus follower in the bio. Do, I'm, not, I'm not trying to hurt anybody. I'm just saying, just let's, let's ask that question. Do people know you as a political opinion first and a Christian second or not at all? Are we assuming the very worst about everything and screaming that the sky is falling? What would someone watching our lives say about where we place our trust, where we see our footing? And how does this directly contrast with Paul's advice in verses 8 and 9? The, hey, whatever's true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, what's excellent, think on these things. If our attention is focused primarily and positively on the good things of God, we can have a fair amount of peace right then and there and be able to echo what John Knox said about Mary, Queen of Scots. The U.S. government, the economy, your boss, have all got nothing on the power of Almighty God. Paul is encouraging us to live like him, like he says, the example I'm giving you in verse 9, to see that no matter what comes up, We don't stand to gain anything by freaking out at the drop of a hat. Paul knows and wants us to know as well that if God is sovereign, okay, all that happens for good or for evil happens because he allowed it to happen for his reasons, for our good, for his glory, and we can have peace no matter where we are or what is happening. But now that I've been telling you to change your circumstances, or excuse me, telling you circumstances don't matter if your perspective is right, we do need to talk for a second about whether or not you do need to look at changing those circumstances. And if we are truly seeing God work in our sufferings, we may become conscious of things that we can change or perhaps should. If we are actively pursuing the word of God, we may see that there is sin in our lives that we need to get rid of. Let me, let me amend that. If we see a holy and just God as he is, I guarantee you, you will see sin in your life that has got to go. You will hate it in contrast to seeing what God is like. So let's talk about Tornado Alley for a second. For those of us who live in Chicago, 
It's easy to be less than charitable when we hear news stories about tragedies and natural disasters that happen in places that get a title like Tornado Alley. It is, again, I'm not saying I've done this, but you can see people kind of having this conversation in areas that aren't there. When you hear about, oh man, another 10 homes were destroyed by a tornado. In Tornado Alley, where they built the house, I'm not saying we should, I mean, you know, we're praying for those people. It's sometimes you got to live where you got to live and it's, it's tough, but it's hard not to be judgmental about that. But for many of us, our sin is creating Tornado Alley right where we are, all right? We reap the consequences of destructive life choices based in sins that we don't want to leave or don't feel that we can. And some of us just need to pick up stakes and just straight up move. Get out of Tornado Alley, right? Now, others around you may be able to see with crystal clarity the ticking time bomb that is your life. But it may take an act of divine intervention for you to realize that you can, in fact, move, that you can, in fact, leave that sin, that problem, that issue. Maybe it's a bad relationship exerting a bad uh, influence on you. Maybe it's a bunch of friends who are definitely going to get you in tr uh, jail, you know, soon. Maybe it's a job that forces you to miss church and keeps you away from the influence of godly people who love you. And you may not realize that there is help for this. Be reasonable, be level-headed, be mature. This is an imperative that can only really be applied by someone who is standing on solid ground and has the perspective to see that there is no need to panic. And, and kind of side note here, uh, somebody listening to this message or somebody you know may be in a situation that is a bit of a tornado alley, but it's not their fault. It's not your fault and it's a situation you need to leave for your own safety. Paul's recommendation in our talk about being reasonable, viewing your circumstances well, standing firm, these are things that were never meant to apply to a woman who is living in a situation that she feels unsafe. And if you know somebody or if you are somebody who is in a home that, okay, you're in a bad situation where someone is going to do you harm, I want to tell you that you're not called to stay there. Get out if you don't know how, if you don't have the wherewithal, pray for courage. Come talk to a pastor. Come talk to somebody here. We want to help you, all right? Moving on. So perhaps you can't identify with the Tornado Alley image. You're an upstanding citizen. You've got a good job, good income, good family, good friends. You haven't missed a church service in years, and you give more money to church and other worthy causes than some people make in a year. Uh, understand these are all great things. I am thankful that you are there. I am happy for you. But if any of those are the basis for your life and peace, you are asking for God to pull a Job and take them all away for your own good. We will only know peace with God when we can put all our hope in God. And if you are basing your sense of peace on the contents of your 401k or how much equity you have in your home, watch out that you are not building everything on a rotten foundation. Uh, as Augustine said, if the things of this world delight you, praise God for them, but turn your love away from them and give it to their maker. And here's another plug for a great Bible book. Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes is an amazing read for everyone in 2020. It just, it beautifully strips away every single thing that we build around ourselves in order to find meaning that isn't God. And I mean, it, it comes off a little emo at times, but it's super good. So now we've got, we've got John and then Ecclesiastes. Everybody's reading those. Excellent. Good. Tell your friends. Okay, moving on to question three. What are you holding on to? Prayer and supplication. If tonight you know that you are a sinner and you've trusted that your sin was punished in Jesus on the cross in 30 AD, that he died and was raised on the third day and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for his saints, prayer should be a thing that you already do. Which is not to say that you're doing it as well as you want to, not that as, as well as you're going to one day, all right? But if we are standing on the solid ground of the promises of God, holding on to Jesus for dear life, 
Paul's third descriptor of the peaceful person should come fairly easy. Paul is telling us to lay down our anxiety and pray. But we must also, as we just talked about, lay down our sin if we are to effectively grasp hold of the confidence that God is hearing our prayers. The biggest obstacle to prayer in our lives is often our sin, both big and small, that we have a hard time letting go of. Now, Scripture is full of references to ways that we make prayer difficult. Remember, prayer is how we communicate with God. It's what we were built to do. We weren't just designed to be standing here praying from a distance. We were built to be walking side by side with God in paradise for eternity. And Adam messed up, all right? And now here we are. But we still have prayer, which is amazing and glorious. Uh, 1 Peter 3, 7, Peter warns husbands to treat their wives well, that their prayers be not hindered. A few verses later in verse 12, Peter tells us, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Psalm 66, 16. Come and hear, all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly, God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. Paul can have peace Because not only does he see God working around him, he knew that God heard his prayers. And no matter what God chose to do, he could rest knowing it was ultimately going to be for God's glory and Paul's good. Paul wasn't anxious because he had confidence that the creator of the universe was in control of all the tough circumstances he found himself in. And they were there because God wanted them to be. And if you want this confidence... Whether you call yourself a believer right now or not, let me tell you, you can have it. It's there. It's there. It's offered to you. Confess your sins, your need for God's help, and he will be faithful to hear you. So as we conclude, I want to ask one more question. Who is holding on to you? I am the mostly proud father of three young kids. And uh, many of you have seen me with my rambunctious like tank of a two-year-old son. His name's Phelan. He's adorable. He's very destructive. He's so so destructive. Um, Two-year-old boys are not necessarily fully developed in a number of capacities, judgment, uh, wisdom, foresight, you know, thinking things through. These are things they have not quite gotten. I think that kicks in somewhere around 35 um, and it's winter, you know, those of you who braved the, the ice and snow to get here, man, there is ice and snow everywhere outside. Like today, he was totally illustrating this. I, you know, he wants to run and do his happy dance on the ice, and it's, it's insane and frustrating. And he's trying to harm himself, I swear. But fortunately, he will hold my hand as we walk. So he's doing it. He's doing the happy dance. He's having a great time. And he's trying to take the express train to Concussionville, all right? And the thing that stops him from hurting himself is not that he is holding my hand. It's that I am holding on to his. That is what is keeping him from harm. Verse 5 said, for the Lord is at hand. For those of you who are keeping track, I didn't actually miss that. I didn't like just gloss over it. I was saving it for the end. Paul is reminding his readers that Jesus has ascended into heaven, but he is coming back one day. And frankly, it could be tonight. There is no adjustment to your perspective like realizing that at any moment, this world, every problem, every cancer, every, everything you've ever had is going to melt away and be replaced by the new heavens and the new earth. That's perspective, guys. Some of the greatest men and women that have ever walked this earth went to horrible deaths 
with smiles on their faces and songs on their lips because they knew what awaited them on the other side and they knew who held on to them and kept them safe. A glorious day is coming that will put every bad thing you've ever experienced, every injustice that has ever been done to you, every natural disaster that our fallen world can produce in perspective and all will be made right. And this world and its problems are not the end. Evil will not have the last word. That same army of the Lord that surrounded the prophet Elisha is coming back with Jesus Christ to make all things new. All the problems of this life that you will ever face are nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed in you when he comes back if you've been adopted into his family. And I, ha I hate to say it, but I have to say it. All of the problems of this life that you will ever face are nothing compared to facing that coming judgment on your own apart from Jesus Christ. If you don't know him, if you don't call Jesus your Lord and Savior, and if you want to know what that might mean for you, Come talk to one of the prayer partners after. They're going to be standing up here. Come talk to a pastor. Come talk to somebody. We would love to talk with you about what that, what that might mean, what, what being a Christian is all about. And if you are a Christian today, are you living in light of Christ's imminent return? I know that I forget about it super easily, right? We have reasons to be stressed out. There's stuff happening all around us. Even bigger than that, we have Netflix to distract us from the glorious realities of what is here in the Word. But God wants us to know His peace, to know that no matter how bad things look, He is in control and He is coming back for His people. Paul goes on just a few verses after the ones we read to say in verse 11, For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul could be content and have peace in every situation because he wasn't looking at anything in this world as permanent. Paul had the perspective to see that the present sufferings of this world were not worth comparing to the glory of Christ that will be revealed in us. And I want to close with just a favorite quote from John Piper. Life is hard. God is good. Glory is coming. Therefore, stand firm in his grace. Let us pray. Holy, merciful God, give us perspective. Thank you for Jesus' perfect life, for the death that he died that should have been ours. Let us see everything around us as you would have us to see it. Let us echo the words of Jonathan Edwards and have eternity stamped on our eyeballs. Let us echo the words of the song that says, Be thou our vision. Let us be people who long for Christ's glorious return and work mightily to reflect your glory to the world around us until then. Bear with our failings. Strengthen us when we are weak. Let us see the hurting people around us and love them as you would have us to love them. Let us have your peace and make us passionate to share that peace with others. All this we pray in the glorious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.